Thank you. Um, this is unique. It should probably happen much more often, but this particular occasion is unique. If you stand outside the front gates of St. James's and you have very, quite long arms, you can touch the digital hub and the National College of Art and a very rich community of the Liberties, and then at Rialto and behind all of that, Fatima, etc. So we've the, our Dublin's largest teaching hospital in such a vibrant, rich community in the center of the city with two superb organizations literally within touching distance. And for the first time, we've come together as a with a united front, almost as a single organization, to challenge, to challenge, or to reflect on the challenge of aging in society in Ireland, but how we can actually capitalize on the changing demographic of aging and make the most of our inner city strength as it is. I've been asked to set the scene about aging, and um, there are some people in the audience who have actually heard me probably give this very same talk a few times, so I, I, I'll, I'll modify it somewhat, but you know, I can't change the facts. The facts are that up to 100 years ago, the proportion of people who were living into older age was very stable, only 3 to 4% of a population were over the age of 65. And then 100 years ago, a remarkable thing happened. People started to live longer. And they started to live longer in countries that have records from the 1840s, as far as we know. They started to live longer by three months per year. So if you were born one year, and your sibling was born two years later, they were likely to live six months longer than you were. And that increase in lifespan has continued in a linear way, without virtually no divergence at all, up until today. So whereas average lifespans were about 47 at the time of Bismarck, when the pension was introduced. Now we can expect to live 81, 82, higher in some European countries and Japan. So that's great. That is fantastic. But it's happened quite quickly in some cultures, and others have had a long time to become accustomed to this. In, in, in France, they've had 115 years to acclimatize to the doubling of the proportion of people over 65 from 7 to 14 percent. We've, we've, we've not quite got there yet. Japan, it will have happened over 23 years. In China, over 26 years. In Brazil, over 20 years. So in some cultures, it's happening very, very quickly. And I'm mentioning this because I actually think this is an opportunity at a global level for us to capitalize on. It's, it's almost impossible to believe if th this trajectory continues, and there's no reason to think it won't, that half of baby girls born in the last five years in Ireland will live to 100. And probably the first person to live to 150 has been born already in Ireland. I, I find, personally, I, can, I really have to stop to, to reflect on those statistical facts. So that's, that's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking towards. And why are we living longer? What's happening that we're living longer? Well, believe it or not, over the last 100, 150 years, healthcare is better. We know an awful lot more about infections, which were a big killer. Our health services and care services are very much better. Our environments are better. We are under less stress and we have more wealth than 100 or 150 years ago. They're the main reasons cited for longer living. Why do we die at all? What is aging about? What is the aging process? Is it possible that we'll reach a stage where we don't die, where we live forever? We, we 
definitely know, we, we're, we're definitely sure about the role of genes in aging. There are still a lot of questions about which genes and what are the factors which modify genes. And I don't mean genes that um, reflect your family history of lifespan. They're responsible for about a third. So if you've got grandparents and parents who lived into their 90 or 8, 90s or 80s, they'll contribute to about a third of your possibility of living a long life. The genes I'm talking about are the genes that regulate the millions of cells in our body, which modify wear and tear. We're a, bait, we're a car, we're a car engine. And after a period of use of the engine and stress, bits start to dysfunction. And those genes trigger activities in the engine to make sure that the bits that are dysfunctioning are discarded and got rid of as soon and as effectively as possible and repaired, and that constant uh, damage repair, damage repair system in all of our cells, as I'm speaking to you now, in millions of your cells, is taking place all of the time. And the other two thirds of the puzzle, which determine how long we live for, are determined by the balance of those systems in our cells, the repair and the damage systems, and the genes that modify them. And then all of those things which, you know, we're, we're almost tired of hearing about. Diet, exercise, that's where they act. They act on those genes, those receptors, and those millions of cells that are functioning now as I'm speaking to you to maintain that delicate balance. And the research that's just going into this whole area of cell aging and modifying aging, I mean, can you imagine if in the morning there was a tablet that we could take, and this isn't beyond the realms of possibility, which controlled that repair damage system forever and never allowed it to fatigue. That's where a lot of the research is taking place at the moment, and there's very, very copious active research in this space. I don't think it'll be in our lifetimes that we see that tablet. Or in my children's lifetimes, possibly not. But it's, people are working towards that, trying to get there. For the moment, however, we have a demographic that's changing rapidly. The biggest change is going to be in the, the proportion of people over 80 in Ireland. That's where the biggest increase is going to be. Over the next 10 years, the number of people over 80 will increase by 80%. That's huge, enormous. So as a society, we need to reflect on quality of life for our society as a whole and for the demographic changes that are taking place. As businesses, we need to reflect on how we can contribute to that quality society for all. And as healthcare providers, we also have to reflect on how we can couple with societies and with businesses to ensure quality towards the end. If you ask people, how would you like to age? I can assure you, the majority of you would say, I don't want to be lonely, I never want to be lonely. I don't want to be worried about money. They don't say I want to be rich. I don't want to worry about money. I want to live in my own home, having an active life until the very end. If I get sick, I want to be seen quickly by the appropriate person, dealt with quickly, and discharged to my own home as quickly as possible. I don't want to get Alzheimer's disease. I don't want to get dementia. I don't want to have a stroke. And I want to die in my own bed. They're not big asks. And it's what the majority of people want. 3,000 billion of disposable income is held by those over 65 in Europe. Almost 80% of disposable income in the US is held by those over 65. There are opportunities for business communities to engage with this demographic in a productive way. And of course, 
An Ireland that's good to grow old in. An Ireland that is using this huge opportunity, capitalizing it on it on a global scale. That Ireland is better for everybody. And in many ways, we are ahead of the cusp with respect to this. We have a lot of very good research activity in this space in Ireland already. And we have very good relationships with our industry partners. We should capitalize on that. And being an island, we can capitalize on that. And we can actually take leadership in many of these domains. I've talked about diet being good and exercise being good, and it's a whole other day's lecture to explain why. But I'm going to leave you with a concept which is real, is better for all society, and which I believe technologies can play a great role in. But it's also maybe a cautionary tale with respect to overemphasis on technology or an expectation that technologies will replace the human resource. In my view, not in my view, the fact is we've been millions of years evolving, millions of years evolving our instinctive interaction with each other. Technologies can complement that interaction, identify early warning behavioral changes, which technologies can also assist in intervening on. But my story is about a little town outside of Rome called Rosetto. Many of you may be familiar with it. And the importance of community for quality health and healthy aging. And in the 1820s, this town ran into really bad problems, a bad place. And up over the next 20, 30 years, about 2,000 of their inhabitants emigrated. But they all emigrated, most of them emigrated, to one place in Pennsylvania. And a Dr. Stephen Wolfe, who was an epidemiologist, gastroepidemiologist in Oklahoma University, had a holiday place near this Rosetta now in Pennsylvania, Rosetta too. And he gave a lecture once to the local communities, the local GPs in, in the 10 odd surrounding towns. And the GP from Rosetta came up to him afterwards and invited him for a drink. And he went for a drink and he said, you know, you're talking about the big heart killer at the time. This was in the 1940s in the US, which was heart disease in young men, relatively young men in their 40s and 50s. And he said, you know, I never see that in Rosetta. People don't die before they're 65. I know it sounds incredible, but I never see it. Wolf didn't believe him, but he was curious by the same token. So his following vacation, he went to Rosetta. And he brought a couple of students with him. And they looked through the records in the town hall. And they found that, according to the death records, this did seem to be the case. People weren't dying as young, and particularly men, as they were elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in the USA. And there didn't appear to be any deaths from suicide. So his curiosity was tickled. And the next semester, he brought a large research group with him from Oklahoma University. And they spent months going through all the known possible risk factors for heart disease and stroke that could give, give rise to this phenomenon. Was it the diet? Must be diet. These Rosettans, it's their diet. But in fact, they were eating a particular type of pizza, uh, which had 41% fat, and fat was well known to be linked to heart disease at the time, so it couldn't be the diet. It must be genetic. So they tracked death rates from Rosettans in Rosetta itself, but also those who had come from Italy, Rosetta in Italy, to other areas in the USA, and they found it wasn't genetics actually, because they were dying in, the, in other towns as much as as, uh, at the same uh, frequency as other US inhabitants. So it wasn't diet, it wasn't genetics, it wasn't smoking. They looked at exercise, they didn't actually appear to exercise very much. They were baffled, they went through all the possible known risk factors. And then one day it hit Stephen Wolfe. He realized that the secret of longevity in Rosetta was Rosetta itself. 
In the 1890s, a young priest had come out from Italy and seen the potential of Rosetta, how poor they were, but their potential, and the fact that they still all spoke the local language, the local lingo, or dialect from, from um, Rosetta, Italy. And he built a community around his church where they grew their own vines, olives, wines, corn, etc. They became independent. But also, they adopted the lifestyle and recreated the lifestyle that they had had in Rosetta, Italy. And that was an egalitarian society where three generations often lived in one house. There were 22 civic organizations for a population of 2,000 people. He noticed people in Rosetta laughed a lot. They used the church a lot. But they had a fantastic, joyous community spirit. And because they were so isolated from everywhere else, from the other towns in, in Pennsylvania nearby, they functioned almost like a microcosm of a bigger society. And then in time, when this came out and the roads widened and Rosettans were diluted by other Americans, of course, this phenomenon of living longer, healthy lives abated. It would be great if we could use that knowledge, and we know now from copious research studies that good social engagement, good interaction, good friendship, no stress and no worry has very positive effects on our immune system, on the genes I was talking about earlier on, which affect healthy aging, on strokes, on cancers, and on heart disease. So there are the objective health effects. But the broader effect of that sort of a society is enormous, and it's tangible for everyone. So in today's talks, I would like you to maybe reflect on Rosetta and how we can embed new technologies, new ideas, innovations, advances in that community potential and use human resource to complement our technological advances and recreate in Ireland a Rosetta, which we have lost over the last number of years, unfortunately. Thank you.